Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our panel on boosting financial inclusion through mobile money. It's a pleasure to see you all with us this morning. My name is Julie Gishuru, a passionate Afro-optimist, and I'm excited to see what comes out of this conversation this morning. We have an incredible panel with us. Uh, let me introduce the panel, starting with the gentleman right next to me. We have uh, Charles. Uh, Mudiwa, Chief Executive of Stanbic Kenya. Let's give him a round of applause, please, ladies and gentlemen. Right next to him, we have Isaac Gashugu. You have all heard of M-Pesa. Isaac is the head of M-Pesa product development at Safaricom. A round of applause, please, for Isaac. Right next to him, the Secretary General needs no introduction, Dr. Muhisa Kitui. Let's give him a round of applause. And with us also on this panel, we are excited to have Elizabeth Rossiello, Chief Executive Officer and Founder of BitPesa, doing some incredible things um, in this space. We'll hear from her in a short while. Round of applause, please. We're happy to have Bisha Hussein with us. Uh, he's the Director General of the Universal Postal Union. A round of applause for Hussein. And last but certainly not least, we have Mr. Njugunandungo. He's the head of the African Economic Research Consortium. And of course, he's the former governor of the Central Bank of Kenya. Warm round of applause. And so, as we ask ourselves, is mobile money our future? And we ask this question knowing full well that we are in a part of the world that perhaps is leading in terms of utilization of mobile platforms and, and, and fintech. But uh, let me start with the former governor. Mr. Njugunandungo, I want you to set the scene for us. Kenya has achieved an awful lot, but there's plenty to be done in other areas as well. Even as we say Kenya has achieved an awful lot, Kenya is still pulling back on an awful lot. And maybe the question I come to you with is, in this space that offers so much opportunity for financial inclusion, what is the balance between fundamentals and, and, and enabling technology to drive change? Where do we achieve that balance? What is your perspective? Let's kick things off there. Please, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. And let me say that I'm very happy to be invited to this meeting. And um, actually, it's a subject matter that is always close to my heart. Although I've moved to the African Economic Research Consortium, which is a capacity building network through research and graduate training and policy outreach. And that's where I also came from when I went to the Central Bank. So essentially, I'm again in the familiar territory of academia, but policy making and, uh, um, should I say, evidence-based policy advice. But then this subject matter is always coming after me, and it's because I spent eight years of central banking, and I think it's one of my best eight years. I think uh, my friend Muhisa might, and <laughs> might, might maybe comment on that. But it is because the market was waiting to be discovered, the market was waiting to be developed, the market was waiting for answers. So essentially, I want to just to comment so that I open the, the discussion in three areas. I want actually to talk about the digital space from where the private sector stands so that we can see financial inclusion is a public policy, but who takes, who takes it forward is actually the private sector. It is the banking sector. The second point I want to maybe push in is because actually the government actually is one of the most important in that ecosystem, especially the, the payments ecosystem. The government must adapt, and this is creating an environment for the private sector to generate. But finally, because we always make sure that we have a conclusive end, I want to talk about how do we consolidate the future. And I think that's what Judy is saying. Where are we going? How do we consolidate that future so that the discussions we have is that we know how much we've come through, we know what are the constraints, but we also know that the future will rely very much on the technological space, the infrastructure available, but more importantly, the capacity, or should I call, state capacity to drive to the next agenda. So let me start with the first point. <coughs> Boosting financial inclusion through mobile phone is very, very important. And the digital space, what actually happened in Kenya, is can be replicated across other countries. 
The first impact of M-Pesa and other products that followed is actually creating a retail electronic payments platform. And I've, I've gone to seminars and people don't seem to, to see how we got into that step. The entry point to financial inclusion or financial services is actually retail uh, electronic payment system. The moment you have an easier uh, retail electronic payment system, it means that people are going to join in the financial services very easily. They have to be efficient, they have to be effective, they have to be, to, to be transparent, and they have to be safe. When we launched M-Pesa in 2007, the turnaround time was 45 seconds. So you can see exactly how your transactions are going. To date, more, almost all products, the turnaround time is five seconds. So essentially, you get confidence, it's real time. And that's very, very critical. Then, once that has, been, uh, has become very clear, that it's a retail electronic payment system, then all of a sudden, despite the fights that we had, I wouldn't go into political economy, despite the fights, the fights we had with, uh, with the big banks about this product, they discovered that it was actually a technological platform to manage micro accounts. We are in Africa, a trip to the bank is very, very expensive. Whether you are, most of us, what do you do? The first thing is to go and check your balances because we are not so sure about the balances. Have, has your salary come, come in? The second thing is that you want to transact. The third thing is maybe you want to draw down your deposits or you want to deposit. But a trip to the bank is very, very expensive. Don't forget, in Kenya, in the 80s bank and 90s, banks had started withdrawing from the rural areas. How do you serve those, those people? So, once the banks discovered that it's a technological platform to manage micro accounts, then the goal or even the magic of financial inclusion was much easier. We, the, the banks, that's the third point in this area is that the banks created virtual savings accounts, virtual, virtual credit, uh, credit uh, supply accounts. And all of a sudden, even women can save in products that cannot be encroached. So we can actually proudly talk about inclusive finance because essentially the topical area is that don't leave everyone behind. Don't leave anyone behind. The bottom line is that you have to make sure that each and every segment of the market is not being left behind. But the fourth, the fourth point in this area which I like most is that Africa is composed of different types of market, they are segmented. And even communicating across those segments of the market is very difficult. And all of a sudden, we have a mobile phone based transactions that was transacting across all markets, informal, formal complexities. You can use your mobile phone to pay for a tea in, in, a, in a roadside kiosk, kiosk, and you can pay your meal in a five-star hotel using the same product. That is very, very important. Finally, on that point is that once you have done that, you have created a structure, then all of a sudden business, fintechs just started rolling out products. I call them sustainable business models for one simple reason, because they transcend across sectors of the economy. And secondly, they are actually affecting the critical part of our life. Look at M, uh, uh, M, M Copper, which is dealing with solar energy. Right, right. Look at uh, uh, other products uh, uh, in agriculture, for example, One Acre Fund. So there are so many. So we have given the private sector a chance to roll out b sustainable business models. I have two points, Judy. Let me <laughs> go over them very quickly. Or you want me to stop? Uh, okay, let me, go to, let me go to government. Because we can now debate how do you allow the private sector to innovate on that platform, which is already there. Somebody else has invested. Telecoms have massive capacity, so it's a question of using that capacity. The second one is that the government has to drive electronic payments. And once the government drives the electronic payments, in Africa, the government is the main employer, is the main uh, buyer, is the main payer. So essentially, once it adopts electronic payments, then we are fine. What will happen is that one of the latest uh, volumes that we, we, we developed with the IMF in last year was uh, digitization and fiscal policy design. I presented the Kenyan example or the Kenyan case study to show that even the Kenya Revenue Authority was designing taxes and even tax payment platforms using the, the retail electronic payment system. E-government, the other day I applied for my passport, it took me 72 hours. 
So I think who, who cannot share in that? Uh, government revenue administration. This is one of the biggest problems in developing countries in terms of leakages of revenue. The moment you have an electronic payment system, then you have already predefined an efficiency platform. And finally, government uh, will manage its targeted social protection programs because we have different pockets of population that will be left behind. They can only be supported through targeted uh, safety programs and that is very very important but be before we finish on that governments themselves can even introduce uh, uh, market uh, related actions like M, M Akeba you can trade with government securities so it means that you have saved and you have avenues for investment let me go to the final point because I would like to make sure that I tie up how do we consolidate the future this is a rosy picture but tomorrow we might find ourselves in trouble. Why? Because we need to make sure that we consolidate. When the market is developing, one of the, one of the issues is actually to make sure that the market remains in the same uh, trajectory. So the first concern is that make sure that there is connectivity. Nobody is left behind. I'm so happy to see that whenever I drive in the rural Kenya, in most of the counties, fiber optic uh, cables are being laid. They were covering the major towns. So we know that nobody will be left behind. Connectivity is important. There are two points about this. You reach everyone else, but also you reduce the unit cost. And secondly, you allow the totality of the economy to innovate around the platform. The second one is to shape the structure of the market to allow an interoperable platform. Of course, Kenyan cases, everybody started talking about interoperability in Kenya. But I always say that that debate was overrated. But Kenyan case is not an, a problem of interoperability. It's a structure of the market. But we need to make sure that uh, that is hap happening. The third, which thank is you, very, thank very you. important. No, I, I, we'll I will come, come and we will come back to you. We will okay. come back to you. I, I just wanted to finish two it's points. Two, then, it's uh, two hours. It's two hours. Uh, we'll come back. We'll come back. Uh, I wanted to finish those two points. Yes. The final point is I, uh, 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 electronic ID to make sure that we secure the market. Yes, and finally, yes. state, I will come back to this, state and institutional capacity to manage market developments. I'll Thank come you. back to Thank you. And can we give him a round of applause? And I think <laughs> it was important to get that context set. And I really wanted to tap into that because uh, uh, Juguna Dumo is coming both from the perspective of having been a governor, so having sat on that side, and also now being on the on the other side of capacity building. Uh, Dr. Ari, I want to come to you now. And, and you know, Mobile money is a true revolution for this African continent. For many of us who we've talked about banking systems who didn't even feel comfortable to enter a bank, let alone set up a bank account, who would never have had an opportunity to have a bank account. So inclusion is one thing. However, the second thing is it opens up the possibilities of a thriving e-commerce environment, cross-border payments, and so much more. As, as we go into this conversation, I do want to tap into a little bit of a story. Um, I dabble in African trade, and I tried to get some goods from Abidjan um, over the last two months. The payments through the banking system took weeks with goods sitting in cargo. It was a total nightmare, and I asked myself, how is Africa talking about a free trade area? How are we talking about e-commerce, when the reality of it is it's so punitive. So as I come to you, uh, Dr. Tari, please take us through what must we do to enable mobile money to work for us? What must we do in government? What must we do in private sector? How does the development world support? Please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the, the passion of Professor Ndungu. Professor Ndungu and I were on a panel at Brookings Institute in 2009 mm -hmm. about Mpesa. And already he spoke with this type of passion. Uh, it's not just from a governor. Dungu and Dem and Professor Demo, who was the, com uh, the, the head of Kenya Communications Commission, <coughs> are the two persons who convinced us as cabinet to legalize MPESA in Kenya. Wow. Wow. Excellent. But as a government, and now that answers to your first question, the Kenya cabinet accept the argument that we gamble and allow something we do not totally understand. <laughs> Governments are usually hesitant, not even just hesitant. They think that uh, regulators are inhibitors. Most governments will not allow you to do something unless they think they totally understand what you're going to do. 
And to me, innovative government is risk-taking to try something that you have not totally understood. Which means that most other governments that have not legislated mobile money have limited risk after seeing the success of Kenya. But it also means another thing. When we did it, the commercial banks in Kenya did not know that they are <laughs> the critical resource, the retail market, was going eaten up by fintech. Today, if you start mobile money in a country where there is no mobile money, the commercial banks are going to be the main ones fighting you. Unless they reform and go into fintech, they will find fintech because it takes away much of the retail business that they have enjoyed. So that's one level. The second, we have to be clear. You know, we have very varied levels in Africa. You know, there is an ambition that in 2022, 50% of Africans will have mobile money. In 2018, 73% of Kenyans already have mobile money. So there's a lot of catch-up to happen in some other areas. Now, the second thing is a big challenge. When products like m -Pesa came up, there was such substantial money in telecos that they could build the infrastructure and get back their payments. Today, the margins of telcos has declined very substantially. That means that there will be need for the state to drive infrastructure for the, digital, for, for the, the broadband inclusion, even mobile connectivity, away from the largest business and human concentrations. And this is a challenge that we have together. Now, there's two things I want to mention and caution. We celebrate the magic of financial inclusion through electron, uh, electronic payment method, mobile money. But there are two things that are very important for us to know. Mobile money may make efficient the movement of services, but on its own does not create the product to sell. Right. At okay. all times, we must think about enhanced productivity to benefit from selling ability. Yes. Otherwise, mobile payment will be for procuring others' produce and services and not selling our own produce and services. That's one. Second, the ability to move money can also be an ability to impoverish oneself. Kenya has a proliferation of betting possibilities. There's microfinance available on your mobile phone. A lot of families are being bankrupted by men buying bets for European football through loans on their mobile phones. And this is another reality that the downside is this. But having mentioned the caution, the, the, the caution it's important to say we have no choices about it. And I'm very, very happy. We have some people who are supporting this initiative. I want to recognize in our presence the head of the Islamic uh, Trade Financing Corporation, uh, who Thank has you. joined us today. <laughs> Professor Sombol, uh, welcome. And among the institutions that are supporting, supporting find ways to finance the inclusion in areas that are not yet adequately covered. And I think these are a collective challenge. Okay, I will tap into you, Professor, in a short while. I, I will come to you. I think next, Elizabeth, let, let me come to your experience because you are squarely in this space, um, trying to maneuver with governments, trying to ensure that you are delivering services, but, but you are finding quite a bit of, of, of a challenge in getting markets to open up. Um, tell us about the Bid Pesa experience and, and what would you want to enable the transformative potential of your, of your uh, technology to really make a change for Africa. What would you need? Over First to you. of all, thank you for having me. And I think this panel is an example of what it's like to have run a startup in this fintech scene in the Silicon Savannah. I've had the support from day one of big thinkers, the brains, in imagining the future in Professor Nguna, and also here with the commissioner who's been very supportive of the story. But at the same time, as I'm sitting here on this panel, and last night we celebrated our fifth birthday, um, we do not operate in Kenya. So we have an office in Kenya, we have employees in Kenya, but we are not allowed to open bank accounts and we are not allowed to transact with Kenyan customers. That said, my company has grown 20x. Um, we do over 40, about $40 million of transactions a month. We've grown from $5,000 of transactions a month five years ago. We just announced in Forbes a major investment by Japan's largest insurance company. And we're licensed, we're the first company of our kind to be licensed by the UK government as a payment institution. And we have that license now in every European jurisdiction. We operate very legally and pleasantly in Nigeria, Ghana, Senegal, DRC, Uganda, Tanzania. But here in the country that I called my home for so many years, 
we were the first, and sometimes as the first, it's not the easiest. And I would just say that what we see is very interesting. The, we think of M-Pesa and the mobile money as building a beautiful road. The Imagine Mombasa Road was turned into a glorious crystal highway. Mm -hmm. And everybody said, wow, who could have imagined this amazing crystal highway? Everybody's around the world is applauding this gorgeous crystal highway. And most of the, the joy of the system is the ability to go into the very rural areas, is the investments that they made with heavy upfront um, investment in infrastructure to provide that crystal road. But now not only are they providing the crystal road, they're making the only car that is allowed to drive on that road. And you have other companies, fintechs, banks, elsewhere, who say, can I build a road connecting to yours? Can I build a service road? I will pay. Charge me a toll. I will jump a hurdle. Ask me for ID. Ask me to get a license. I will do whatever you want. I will pay a high fee. I will get compliance. But to cut off that road, we see, is a, is a limit. And in other countries, such as Morocco, where there are very strict controls, they have a beautiful crystal road, mainly by one of the, the main companies, Cash Plus. It's a monopoly there. And they charge you to use the road. It's an expensive cost, but you're allowed to use it. In other markets, and I would, if anybody here is interested, CGAP did a beautiful report about aggregators. In other markets, there's a whole industry, a subsegment called an aggregator model. And that aggregator will build a highway road and let companies go on it. And they'll make sure they have the license and they do the compliance and they pay the fee. And so there are ways to do this legally. There are ways to do this safely. There are ways to do this where everybody makes money and the whole ecosystem benefits. I think the problem is, is that the innovation is happening so quickly. And who is absorbing the innovation? So innovation is coming at the country like a fire hose. And it's not just one major crystal road. There are crystal roads being built everywhere. And everybody's <laughs> looking at that original crystal road. But this is a large country country. We cannot just have Mombasa Road. It has to be covered from head to toe. So how are we doing that? And it's been very interesting for us. We operate in countries where we were allowed to operate with very little licensing, and we helped the government make the license. In other markets, we were not allowed to put a toenail into the country until we had full licensing. So we've seen a broad spectrum. Even in the East African community, we've seen a, a quite a very difference. And I think for a lot of startups, a lot of innovative startups, they're usually begun by people who are not yet in these big companies. Mm -hmm. So they have limited capital. They have limited experience. They might be making mistakes. They might look a little bit messy. So uh, in other markets like Europe or Asia or, or North America, you see the retail banks purchasing these companies, bringing them in-house. Instead of having your R&D team, your research and development team, inside, like in the olden days, mm -hmm. now the R&D is on the outside. Right. So you can decide whether you want to purchase it or not. So I think there are definitely models to go forward. We understand that we were the first, so of course it's been exciting. And we haven't given up, and we, we speak a lot about this, so I'm happy to share what we... Thank you so much, and that's a great analogy you've just shared with us. Um, and, and we envision the challenge so well through that. Um, let me come now to the, the, the banking system. And Charles, I, I want to tap into, into your perspective on, on mobile money, the opportunities, fintech, inclusion, collaborations, partnerships. Where is Stanvik sitting in this space, and what do you see the future as? Well, well, thank you very much for, for, for this opportunity and to, to join this panel. Uh, I mean, I think there are a number of um, stereotypes that people put out of banks, which are, I think we probably need to just adjust. Uh, well, the first one is uh, your experience about the Cote d'Ivoire. Mm -hmm. I probably think you have the wrong bank. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, just on a lighter note, but I'm sure you, I mean, it's, I think it's better than that. I mean, certainly payments have improved in the banking sector. Uh, than spending a week trying to get money to Ivory Coast. Um, I certainly can speak for my bank who would do a better job than that. Okay. Um, the second thing that's also important is that the banks don't necessarily see the fintechs as enemies. Um, if anything, I think we see them as, uh, as partners and complement us because we, we're sharing a platform and working together. So, I mean, financial inclusion is for all of us. So, so the banks see it as a, as a part of the process of of complementing each other and helping each other uh, in areas that we, we possibly can't deal with. Um, so so the, the, there are a couple of points that we, we just need to think about as we resolve this. Um, the first thing is uh, two terms that I'm going to use, um, and I'll use on, 
and Commissioner's statement, which is about value creation. Because I think that's an important point. And for us in the bank sector, and certainly for Stanbeg, what we see as value creation is that we need to deal with what I call business offense. Because I don't think we think about I mean, the point that has been made around how do we get value creation besides just ability to move money across? And what do we need to do to create value creation? And, and there are three key things that need to happen to deal with that. The first thing is that the, the most common thing that's spoken about is provision of access to credit or access to funding. How do you provide that? And then the second piece that has to deal with this is about access to markets. How do you create markets? And then the third leg is access to, if you want to call them business skills. Now, that's what creates value creation. And, and, it, I, and I noticed this conference, there is a theme around how do we get women empowered and how do we get them that. And now, the value creation is actually the more important piece around this. How do you create the markets that allow people to use the mobile platforms to generate wealth and be able to create more wealth rather than just being able as a payment mechanism? So payment is level one. Mm -hmm. You need to move to level two, which is value creation right, right. and creation of wealth and employment and general other things. Um, the second thing that we need to think about, and in that space, we have what I call business offense. In other words, an entrepreneur starting out on your own is very lonely. No one trusts you with money. No one trusts you with the, with the market. No one wants to teach you how to do things. So, so you have to figure out how do we create, deal with this business offense and get them into the market. The second issue that we need to deal with is uh, a contradiction, which is uh, in terms of the law. There's a fundamental difference between legal age of majority and economic age of performance. And, and, and for me, I distinguish the two. The legal age says you have to be 18 and above to start being productive, to get all your identification, to vote, to do all the things, including uh, owning a phone in your own personal right. Economic age means that I started 10 years, 12 years, I'm right, already an economic right. player. So I start to perform in the economic space. And the, when we talk of mobile, your biggest participants and active members are actually sitting below the 18 bracket. You are right. <laughs> and, and, but also, more importantly, for Africa in particular, yes, if you look at Kenya, I mean, 60% of our population is sitting in this group. So our own laws, by default, automatically exclude 60% of our population because they cannot have access to all the legal instruments mm. that make them legitimate right. in terms of the law. They actually are operating illegitimately even before they start that. So even for us, for open a bank account, if you're below 18, you have to go through your parents or mm. some other person. You legitimately cannot do You can have a child account, but it's supported by an adult. So we need to figure out about the economic age versus our legal age and how do we legitimize the economic age into our statutes and allow them to operate because then it starts to provide economic freedom. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That's fascinating. Some very interesting points there. And I think on inclusion, that is a point that is not often discussed, but in a very young continent, it is a very relevant point. Uh, thank you for that. I want to come to the MPESA experience, then I'm going to take a look at the postal opportunities. Um, but, but Isaac, Looking at M-Pesa and everything it's achieved, and, and the need for Africa really to, to scale up, to, 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 to do better when it comes to e-commerce, to start to build a culture around e-commerce, which will work so much better for us, um, allow us to leapfrog a lot of the challenges and experiences that others have had to go through. What do you see? What's your bird's eye from your position as head of M-Pesa? Where are the opportunities and where are the challenges? Thank you, Julie, for having me here. Um, I think when you talk about mobile payments, Press on. Your, your phone is not on. They need to adjust the level of sound. Continue to speak. Okay. 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 I thought I was digital. Better, yes. Yes. It's on now. <laughs> yeah. So I think when you talk about mobile payments, a lot of times we focus on just you know the normal transactions where you are sitting at home and you are making, you are paying for your utility bills, and a lot of times we miss that as an e-commerce transaction. Now, looking at where Kenya is heading, and e-commerce as we know it, where you are shopping for things online and you need to pay to make payments online, M-Pesa has really helped, uh, and, and, and we've gone ahead of the de de developed countries in that uh, aspect. From where we sit, it's opening up M-Pesa so that even e-commerce providers are directly able to be powered by M-Pesa payments 
and by other online uh, mobile payments. Uh, as uh, Professor said uh, I, way before, if you don't allow innovation to grow, and if you curtail innovation because you need to have too much control, then it doesn't grow. Looking at e-commerce and how mobile payments would fit in there, we already have the frameworks to know who is, making for, who is paying for what payments. Uh, and when you come to mobile payments, then there's traceability of payments. So in that sense, I would say by its nature, uh, the fact that you don't have to go to a physical institution to make a payment, then emphasize by default it's, it's, it fits naturally into e-commerce payments. Yeah. But I want to move beyond the Kenya conversation on this. And I really want to ask, yesterday a young man from Burkina Faso, anybody, not yesterday, Tuesday afternoon, a young man from Burkina Faso expressed his frustration. You know, he, he spoke to us about the inability to pay on PayPal. You know, they don't recognize us. We can't pay for things. We can't receive payments for, and our diaspora want to buy our products. So I want to take a look at, you know, a product like M-Pesa, uh, you know, what responsibility or what opportunities does the African landscape offer to you to go in there and try to figure out how we can enable payments on the African continent? Let us remember, nobody in PayPal came asking our governments or anybody whether they should set up. They did it. So does the private sector have a responsibility to boldly go into Africa and say, we are going to enable this space, we're going to open this space up, we're going to transform the realities. What's your thought on that? Thank you for driving to that angle. Um, when it comes to opening up uh, uh, Kenya to the world, I think Safaricom has actually championed that very well. We recently partnered with PayPal and it's a good conversation that you brought. And what we did is PayPal is already out there. A lot of Kenyans were actually doing online businesses and as you said, we forget about the young people who even operate from their homes and are doing a lot of online businesses and being paid through PayPal. The problem that we had is they couldn't access that money from M-Pesa. And for the longest time, we had people trying to bridge that gap until our partnership with PayPal was approved by Central Bank because it, it's seen as, a, as an international money transfer process. So we still had to go through the regulatory process. And finally, we got the partnership to work. So, being big out there is a big is a good thing but it also attracts a lot of controls when it comes to regulation so sometimes you take enough a, lo a lot of time before that happens private sector has a big role in driving the opening up of the ecosystem if we didn't go to paypal and western union which we did very recently to allow kenyans to send money outwards not just to receive uh, then we wouldn't have opened that opportunity to Kenyans. PayPal currently we've seen a lot of growth. We, we, we have Kenyans transacting more than 20 billion uh, in, in a very short time. Mm. And, and to me that is a fantastic growth, especially to the young people. Thank you. I have to honestly say that um, I had money seated in PayPal for years that I could not access. For years. And when uh, Safaricom finally made the connection, I was able to now access that money. And it was a huge problem for me. But I remain with the question of how do we open up Africa to Africa. And I come with that to you, Bishar Hussein. And looking at our postal services, and we've spoken to the fact that if there's one service that reaches the most remote parts of this continent that reaches our women who are out there in the farms in the rural areas that reaches families in in, 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 in you know far-flung places it is the postal service so what is the responsibility and the opportunity for the postal service in this space of mobile money thank you Julie for that uh, excellent question uh, first of all please allow me I'm the paid servant of the post so I'm a good advocate the oxygen in the air, we take it for granted, is a very critical element we know we can't do without. Uh, Professor Nugu said a trip to the bank is very expensive. 80% of them withdrew from the rural areas. And that's true for many, many other organizations. But for us in the Universal Postal Union, the very, very essence of our creation was to serve humanity and we have what's called universal service obligation. No one should be left behind. That is our guiding principle. Having said that, we have the widest, no question about it, physical distribution network, footprint, where no other institution, we are second to none in that aspect. What do we do with this? We have been in the financial business for a very long time. The Universal Postal Union Postal Payment Service was established in 1889. It's more than a century of nearly 
uh, of service, of financial services. Of course, we have used and adapted every technology along the way to provide service. For all of a little older generation, you know what uh, the money order service of the post office, when really uh, banks could not be able to reach everywhere in the world, it's the postal uh, organization that used to have money order, physical order service, as well as telegraphic money order service. We used those technologies at the time. Fast forward 2018 now, in the world of the digital space, we use technology to be able to leapfrog and provide services to the citizens. And here again, we have carried out uh, several studies with World Bank and also with the uh, UN Women. And we have, we have come to the conclusion that uh, uh, the most people who have been left out, we have 1.5 billion accounts in, for those people who have completely no other access to financial services. So this tells you that we are there where the people are. We provide uh, technical solutions. We provide cash in, cash out. We provide digital wallets. We provide now e-commerce enabled postal financial systems and that can be able to uh, assist you solve the problem we're talking about here. This week we talked a lot about creation of e-com platforms. And the, one of the things that you're going to, all the barriers we have seen, it is a very ambitious program. Once this concept takes, uh, is taken on by government, and again I have to put this caveat really, it must work with government, because governments are critical uh, components in creation of this. We have one-stop solution where your financial payment system will be online and it will be done instantly. You don't have to go through any other institutions. And this payment system is uh, the Universal Postal Union will have the oversight of these things. We have got the, the security uh, systems and then you overcome all those barriers we're talking about. So this is the, 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 the business proposition we bring to the, uh, the, the whole question of inclusivity. So getting into the space, actively being part of the transformation is what the Postal Union Absolutely. is doing. Um, I'm coming with one more round of questions and then I'm going to open it up to the floor as well. I see you, Elizabeth, come in here. You wanted yeah, to? Yeah, um, I'd love to talk about this because we work across Africa, so about this Pan-African. Mm -hmm. And my background is in foreign exchange. And when I came to Africa, I worked in microfinance, and I was a rating analyst. And the biggest problem we saw was microfinance banks across Africa lending in euro and dollar, and then on lending in Ghanaian CDs, Ugandan shilling, et cetera. And there was an FX mismatch. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about moving from the post cash service, which is, by the way, one of the great aggregators in West Africa, Numerit operates across 15 different countries using the postal service, so that, again, the aggregate of matter. If you want to send from Senegal, where we have an office in Sefa, to Kenya, there's no Standard Bank in Senegal, so there's no Echo Bank in Senegal um, that, that connects, so you really have to use a third party. Right. And so for this third party, for FX, part of the reason we started Bitpesa, one of the most important reasons, was to solve the problem of African currency liquidity. If we want our African currencies to grow and to thrive and not to be dollarized, mm -hmm. we need to create liquidity and brokerage. And one of the first products we had was the ability to connect PayPal to M-Pesa. Mm -hmm. And they didn't like it because we were not licensed, but we were saying exactly this problem. We said there's no liquidity between PayPal mm -hmm. and M-Pesa. Mm -hmm. Why should usually Americans stand in the IHUB and cash out PayPal in cash for Kenyans that had it stuck right. when we can make a more a legal system? So that liquidity matching. So if we're looking to connect the postal service with the banks, if we're looking to connect the mobile money with fintechs, we need to think about African liquidity matching. And in a healthy financial system, you do not just have five big banks. You have banks. You have MFIs. You have SACOs. You have cooperatives. You have brokerages. Mm -hmm. You have trading houses. You have clearing houses. We need to see on this crystal road more than the pro box. We need to see <laughs> motorcycles. We need to see Land Rovers, Lamborghinis, some BMWs, bicycles. some Mercedes. We need, to see somebody walking. <laughs> we need to see variety because without variety, we don't have liquidity. And without liquidity, there's nobody to quickly Co compete with the bank from Burkina Faso to Kenya. Right. right. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I, so let's touch on the issue of state capacity. And, and with that, I'll come to you, uh, Jugona, please. Um, this is a complex area. It's an ecosystem. And a lot needs to be done. We need to have thinkers who can comprehend, who can envision, who can 
government is not an innovator, but we need to have them understanding some of these concepts. How do we shift the way government does business so that they can actually work for the continent rather than against the continent? Please. Thank you, Thank you very much, Judy. And that's the, that's the point I was coming to towards my uh, conversation earlier, it was the point I wanted to touch on. It is state and uh, institutional capacity, because essentially it's very, very critical. And because uh, my friend Mohisa has mentioned about bookings, the first uh, foresight uh, paper on this subject matter was last year, and I argued for a transformative and uh, innovative regulatory technology is required in states and state capacity and uh, state institutions why do we need this and what do i mean about this one we need capacity to understand the dynamics of the market because essentially the positives of the market can be destroyed i'm coming back to mukisa's mukisa's point about uh, even betting a good platform will be used but it will also be misused why we need state capacity is to make sure that there are institutions that protect the market and there are institutions that regulate the market and regulation is working within predefined parameters. So we have to strengthen this. And this is where we, we really need to make sure that the regulators and the protectors of the market are also innovative. They are not going to stifle innovation. Let me say, a few months ago I went to UK. We had a workshop on financial inclusion and fintechs. And what hit me was one person saying that in Kenya there are three million Kenyans who have been blacklisted in the virtual savings and virtual credit account because they borrowed to bet and they are not paid back. I said, I don't know about that idea. And he said, it is not a small three number. Million. Yeah, three million. It's, a, it's not a small number because that's 10% of the adult population. So when I came here, of course, I went to the CRBs because I was a regulator of CRBs to ask what is happening. The point is this, a good platform, efficient platform can be used very effectively, but can also be misused. This is where state capacity and even institutional capacity to make sure that you're protecting the market, but you're also regulating the market innovatively. That is going to be the most important point of our movements towards development. Thank you. And it's achieving that balance. I come to you, uh, Dr. Muhisa Kitui, now. And, and that balance is critical, right? At the same time, you know, there's an African saying that, uh, that tells us uh, to learn how to cut a tree you cut a tree. So, and very often our biggest problem is, is being able to walk the talk, being able to implement some of the things we see. We tend to, 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 to be very risk averse sometimes. Uh, where do you see the continent going? And if you were to advise on key policy shifts that, that need to be effected, what would, what would they be? Well, you, you are at the core of why we are having this e-commerce week for Africa in Nairobi. That the laggard states need peer pressure, need exposure to best practice, need to see what others are doing. You listen to Kenya, they are on secondary problems, challenges and opportunities. But more than half of Africa is in uh, class one. How do the states see the enabling power of mobile money? And what is, does it take to create the regulations? to legislate, to facilitate this energy and potential to be realized. I think it's, it's very, very important that we get the political conversation right. For those who are being left behind, there is a responsibility. For the continent, the potential of the continental free trade area for Africa will never be realized unless we start addressing collapsing mobile wallets. Unless we start finding ways of supporting and even governments driving like the East African governments did with, uh, with, 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 with telephony. Before the European Union did it this year, East Africa, by decision of presidents, banned um, roaming charges on telephones between Open the East African Open the space countries. up. Open yeah. the space up. Yes. Uh, it cost me the same to call a person in Kigali as it cost me to call a person in Central Business District of Nairobi today. Um, but this phenomenal liberating ability enables services in Africa. So governments must go beyond where they have been. Governments must offer consumer protection, best practice. And you cannot unlock 
e-commerce potential through mobile money and this you address cross-border movement of those services. I see in East Africa one of the main vehicles has been you go to Kampala you find a Ugandan in Kampala has a Kenyan number with the M-Pesa because they are using the M-Pesa service. But we need that service to be available on a Ugandan number. Right. So that is the challenge of cross-border legislation, regulation, and of course, consumer protection and customer assurances that is necessary to win the trust of virtual trading. Ultimately, it's driven by political will. Yep. It's political will. Um, I, I want to come to you, Charles, on your ideas on, on key policy shifts that we need, and then, and then you, Isaac, please. Okay. I think for us, the couple of them, um, the, the first key policy shift, I think, has been said, I mean, Stan Big, we're in 20 countries across the African continent. And, and, and the issue about portability and capital flows becomes important. That part of the achievements of Africa has to be about our ability to move capital across different geographies and to allow free movement. Uh, but it's not just about moving capital. It's also about moving um, goods as well. Because it's one thing for me to be able to pay for something in Uganda, but if it's going to spend uh, two weeks sitting at the border because we're processing it, then it just defeats the whole essence of it. That's one. The second thing is to understand the generations that we're dealing with. A lot of our young people, and I think the point that we are discovering is, um, and I know our central bank governor always talks about this, that the next biggest worry we need to worry about is cyber security. And, and the biggest threat is not going to come from an old man sitting in the office. It's going to come from a child sitting in their mother's bedroom on a borrowed phone or their father's phone which they're playing around with and they're going to unravel the whole market. So to what extent are we being able to understand the, the market that we're dealing with and to legitimize that market? Because to a large extent, even in press, I think we all spoke about it, it was legitimized after the event. But how do we legitimize the economic trade that's happening now? I'll give you an example. We're talking about gaming. I've got a, an 18-year-old son. And I didn't realize this, but there's a whole thing where you can make money and make money from playing a v, what were those video games. It's a big world out there. Yeah. Gaming is and, and, massive. And, and, gaming is a massive yeah. economy. Just build ten cents. And, and, and the prizes learning. are not small. I mean, the winner for the FIFA gaming thing gets almost $250,000. So this is being played not by adults, but by teenagers who are 12, 10, and thereabouts. Now, how do we legitimize this economy? Because it's real, and it's real money that's actually happening. So, and it's a form of gambling, but it's also a real economy. So there is a whole new economy that we actually don't know and have not legitimized. And as the banking sector, we see that because the inflows that come into it, we actually see them coming through us. Mm. And yet they are not legitimate economy. So it then sits into the whole idea of blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and how are we going to react to those? Because all that sits in a mobile platform because it's all being played on a mobile device. So right. when we talk about mobile money, right. let's not just think about payments only. Mm. Let's think about the whole mobile economy and what it actually means from cryptocurrencies to gaming to trade to everything. How do we get that? And as a bank, we see these things coming through. And we would like governments to change those regulations. Very interesting. So stop closing your eyes to maybe uncomfortable truths that maybe you have good platforms, maybe those platforms can be used in a, in a negative way. And therefore, how do we recognize what is happening, recognize the potential in the movement, but create policies that work for transformation and positive growth in Africa. And I think that's very interesting. Isaac, very quickly tapping into you on your ideas on policy shifts. I'll come to that side, then open to the floor. Okay. Thank you. Now, the first thing I'll talk about policy is what we've seen on credit, which is a very big uh, industry in Kenya as it is. And as Bernard Jugona said here, we've seen a lot of people taking credit and using it for the right purposes. Mm -hmm. So we've seen people who take it for betting, but we've seen a lot of women, especially, who have grown their businesses because of Mshwari and other such facilities, where before they couldn't access credit, Mshwari opened up a credit of $1, which no other bank was able to give at that time. So in terms of policy, there's a balance between using the data that you have to advance credit to people who, who are not covered by the form of financial uh, services, and, the, and of course, complying with the GDPR regulations, 
that, that would be the biggest thing that we need as a country to, to make sure that it's governed properly. The next thing is in the opening up of the economy, I know we have global representatives here. Uh, our working with Western Union, especially transfer to PayPal, we've seen access to more than 200 countries, right from Kenya, right from MPESA, by just working with Western Union and PayPal. Now, what that means to Kenyans is that part of the $2.2 billion that we get annually uh, from the global, from the people in the diaspora, 15% of it is coming through M-Pesa. And what that means is then we have people who are sitting here in Kenya, parents who are being sponsored by their children out there, but we also have parents who are now able to pay for st studies to their children abroad. Mm -hmm. And to me, that opens Kenya to the world and, of course, op brings the world closer to Kenya. So as we look at the policies, the, the way we regulate between countries is very important. East African countries are still seen as foreign countries. So the, the regulation between us sending money to Uganda and sending money to the U.S. still goes through the same regulation of international money transfer. So if I was to skew two things, I would skew the process of data monitoring and how we can use data and how we open up the markets and what we consider as the trading zones, which I'm sure Mukisa will be much more suitable to Th think about. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Hussein, I come to you now. And, and um, as, I, as I get ready to open the floor, what I, what I want you really to do is to paint a picture for us of how you and your organization can ensure that those who were previously underserved, some of the women in our communities, those who um, rural populations, how can you transform Paint that picture for us of transformation. How can you, through the Postal Service, transform their lives through financial inclusion? Well, thank you very much, um, Madam Julie. I want to say that um, the Universal Postal Union is a key actor in the provision of financial service and special payment areas. Uh, as I told you, over 2 billion people across uh, the world uh, have uh, very, very uh, important aspects, uh, what we call um, accessibility, affordability, eligibility, as well as, of course, uh, the financial literacy campaign is being carried out by the Post. But more specifically what we do here, I, and here I want to go to practical terms, the UPU uh, has, uh, uh, we provided technical solutions for international payments, uh, we call international financial services, but also technical assistance to, support, so to assist Posts in digitizing of the Postal Financial Services to further financial inclusion through our Financial Inclusion Technical Assistance Facility, we call it FITAF. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to make, um, um, uh, in, through this uh, program, we uh, help these uh, postal organizations uh, with software acquisition, digital finance uh, feasibility studies to undertake uh, opportunities to digitize their, fire, their systems, uh, technical expertise. We give them training and capacity building and promotional campaign so that post can pro provide the services evaluation and monitoring. And um, I will have to make, uh, we are going to make, uh, uh, I want to take this opportunity uh, to very proudly um, announce officially that we have uh, selected, uh, 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 we have a program to be able to assist 20 countries bet between now and 2020 in achieving this, those, those standards. And therefore, we uh, proudly uh, announced today that we have selected four countries in Africa and three in Asia, Benin, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Ghana, and Rwanda to benefit from this assistance. Right. And we are going to, uh, again today, open up a call for new members to be able to benefit from this system. And uh, I want to actually conclude my uh, remarks here to thank two very important partners <coughs> who have helped us achieve this. This is the Belinda, Melinda Bill Gates Foundation and Visa who have really contributed a lot of resources in making us, uh, helping us to achieve these standards. Thank you. One last one before yes. I get out to ask me a, a specific question. Yes. I'll give you uh, an example of Burundi. Uh, we, uh, we, we, we do money transfers. What we have done here with Burundi, with the, with the collaboration with, uh, with IOM, is that we have set up a corridor mm -hmm. where the diaspora people in, in Belgium today can be able to wire money to Burundi, to 156 postal outlets using our system and at a, uh, at a, a commission of less than 4%.
compared to what other uh, what MTOs provide. That is now achieving the, the United Nations goals for having less than 5% uh, target. So that's what we're trying to okay, do. Okay, let's give a congratulations on the project that they've launched four countries in Africa, three countries in Asia, and a call for more to, to, to apply, to come on board. Uh, I'm coming to the floor now, and um, I see the professor is not seated right now. So I see your hand, sir. I, th I believe we have um, Ethel with us, who was on the panel yesterday no so i'll start with the questions i think your hand was up sir go ahead thank you hello um i'm herman smith from Senfri, um a think tank in cape town we've recently done a landscaping study of kenyan online platforms and um we were quite uh, reassured to see that mobile money features quite highly in the payments acceptance on these platforms um but there's quite a significant gap between the payment acceptance for customers, so i.e. about 60% of the platform's customers could pay with mobile money, but on these platforms only 40% accepted mobile money as a mechanism to pay the providers of goods and services on those platforms. So um, for Safaricom, but for also the other members on the platform, um, what is it about the features of mobile money or the pricing structure uh, which makes us an ineffective tool for people to generate income over these platforms? Okay, thank you. So, Isaac, I'll bring that to you in a moment. I'll take, there was a hand at the back somewhere, the gentleman over there, and then I'll take the lady. Is that a gentleman? Ge yes, so I'll take those two, and then I'll come to this side. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, but I will speak in French, if it's possible. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much. To the panelists, my name is Untesi Tiraloba from Burkina Faso, and I had spoken about the problem with PayPal, and ha as it's coming up again, I think this would be the appropriate moment to try and find a solution for mobile banking. From the beginning, let me say, we should understand that in Africa, most people are already connected to the internet through their telephones, most people. Those who connect through their laptops in the office, they are the minority in comparison to those who use the mobile phone to connect to the internet. So it would be good if someone could be able to order a service and pay it for it immediately. For, for an example, it should be possible for us Africans to say that, and it's just an idea just coming through my head at the moment, if there's a theatre group coming through Nairobi or Burkina and I want to go in my little village in Burkina and I want to go and watch this performance, the easiest way would be to pay with a ticket by phone f over the internet. But it's not possible for us to do that via the internet, but we should be able to take advantage of this that I'm able to watch somebody performing, we should be able to pay for it. So the idea is that from my phone, I should be able to connect to the internet and not only pay from my phone, but also have access to that performance. So mobile money. So we're able to have this, go forwards with all of this and to be able to have this most used way of having access to the internet. Thank you. I feel your pain. I, I need to say that in Kenya, it is done. In fact, the vast majority of concerts and events, tickets are sold online. We pay online. And I think we just need to get the continent moving together. And even Kenya has a lot more to do, but we need to move. I will put your question to the panel. Gentlemen over there, do I see other hands, by the way? And lady over there. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Julie. My name is Kaunga Chule from Strathmore University. Um, mine is a question. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, the former director for f touching on the digital identification in his opening remarks. However, my question is, how can digital identification systems in developing countries be better designed or adapted to protect people's privacy and empower them with greater control over their own personal data? Thank you. 
Thank you very, very much for that question. I'll take uh, the lady over here and then bring it to the panel and I'll come back to the floor. Go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you so much. My name is Chris M. Tonga and I come from Malawi working for government in the Ministry of ICT. I just want to learn from the experience of Kenya. How did you manage to like, uh, bring people onto the platform of M-Pesa, especially those people that are in the villages. Because the case that we have back home is the fear of technology. People do not want to like uptake the technology that is coming in and we see this as a very big challenge for us to bring e-commerce on board and move forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I'll take those first. I will come back. I see your hand. Um, um, very interesting uh, questions there. Um, you know, maybe I'll start with the last one so, 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 and, and, and then move down that way. How did they take on the technology? Before I even put it to the panel, I'll say if it works, they will use it. <laughs> but having said that, Elizabeth, your hand is up. Let me tap into you then, Dr. Dr. Yes, Dr. Um, uh, first of all, even Safaricom did not know it was going to succeed the way it did. The initial projections of Safaricom were less than... Uh, 10% 10, 10 of what turned out. We did not know how inefficient our systems were until we saw what efficiency meant. That's one. But I also want to touch on the question of privacy, which I think is very important. One of the most important areas of engagement between international organizations, the UN family, consumer protection agencies, and governments is how do you grow the integrity of systems to protect privacy? To protect data. One of the culprits is how quickly our consumers volunteer private data for free to take uh, platform giants. I mean, all the big giants are making easy money through advertising because they sell your, your private data and you always volunteer to them. I very much appreciate the leadership of the European Union in rolling back creating model legislation on consumer protection in the digital era. But I think we, it, there's no gain saying that we have a collective responsibility while we celebrate the greatness of technology yes. to look at the challenges and vulnerabilities of consumers and pro grow the integrity of data, grow the capacity of the state to strengthen effective and actionable privacy rules and protection of consumers. Thank you. Having said that, how many people in this room are tweeting? Can I just see hands go up if you're tweeting and sharing? Please tweet now from this panel session that we are saying anybody loading, downloading, uh, putting an app on their gadgets should be very careful about what rights they give to that app to access their data. It is an important warning that everybody should have. Please share that. Please share that. Elizabeth, come in. Sure. So 10 years ago, I gave a training to the Malawi Central Bank on microfinance. And what we reported was very interesting. Opportunity Bank in Malawi was using trucks with ATMs and agents on the trucks going into the most remote areas where it wasn't profitable to have a branch office. They also partnered with, I believe it was Farm World, which had a, a, a deposit box. So they used a sales distribution channel that was separate from their own microfinance to, <coughs> to manage collections. So why am I mentioning this? It's all about the infrastructure. If you want technology to the most remote areas, you have to provide the infrastructure to get there, which is what Safaricom did so famously, which is invest in outreach, invest in locations, invest in education, and then you can pull back on the investment as it becomes more digitized. And just this morning on the radio, I was hearing about PesaLink. Um, being worked into the morning radio stories. I mean, radio is a powerful communicator in the regional area. So if it works, there are ways to do it if there's somebody to invest in it. And that takes me to also the data privacy question. And this is where I think I differ from a lot of my, the African lobbying groups that I work with, which is that I don't believe data should be centralized to protect it. And we have a lot of African governments and we have a lot of people in government here who believe that to control, we need to own 100%. So all servers must be in country, in one place. That's the scariest thought. If I put all my jewelry in one place, no matter how much I protect it, it's a single point of failure. Mm -hmm. And what technology has told us and what theory and technology and security theory tells us is that you're supposed to hide your jewelry all over your house in many different places, not just in one place. And that's mm -hmm. part of what cloud security is. And and privacy and security, and I think it's, it's a fundamental shift in how we've been thinking about security prior to this. Very interesting. Yes, and you've got to come in, please. Thank you. And then Charles. 
Thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you very much for those questions. And I think, let, let me start with the last question, which is developmental in a sense, market development. And I remember I went to, the, to Marawi, they had the 50th anniversary of the Bank of Marawi. And I made this presentation. But let me summarize. The first thing is to realize that mobile phone, financial services, is a development in Kenya. Everybody looks like it's M-Pesa is a product. It's not a product, it's a process. The first stage was payments transform. We, we transformed from transfers to payments, retail electronic payments transfer uh, platform. The second one is where financial inclusion takes place with virtual, sav uh, virtual savings account. The third one, which is the most innovative, and I hope my friend would have pushed it even further, they use your transactions and savings data to generate credit scores to price your short-term credit. All of a sudden, we managed to actually overcome some of the problems with credit markets in Africa. That is collateral technology that is in use, it's inhibiting. And we managed to overcome that. I think that's what I call reverse engineering. The final, the final stage is cross-border payments. And somebody mentioned about Burkina Faso. The moment you develop those platforms and you allow for cross-border payments, payments platforms will talk to each other. They are interoperable in terms of what are the connectivities. And that's where we are. That's what uh, Mohisa is emphasizing. Even trade itself will take place the moment payments platforms are doing Talking the job, each other. whereas the fiscal infrastructure is doing the job. But a final point, the moment you see these developments, then all of a sudden you'll find that it is puts pressure on the government to actually install the totality of financial infrastructure. That includes even market protection. Thank you. I'll allow Charles and then Hussein very briefly to come in. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think the question around how do you get people, I mean, I also have worked, I worked in Malawi, I think, for six years of my life at some point. Uh -huh. um, and, and I think one of the things that you have to deal with is about how do you solve for cash? Because I think one of the things that we, we tend to look at is it's almost a transition from from cash, what is your next best to alternative? It is money, cash. Now, how do you solve for cash? Because if people feel they're comfortable with using the money, and therefore they don't see the need to move into other payments, mm -hmm. and how do you create the confidence that my, my, my cash is equivalent to a number in a mobile phone, and how do you create, bridge that gap? Right. And it's the convenience that you then bring in and the cost that comes in and the ability for you to be able to do interpayments across for that. But you need to solve for cash in the first place right. to make it possible for people to cross that bridge. Okay. So, Hussein, very quickly, and then you had some specific questions. So I am coming to you, Isaac. Very quickly, please. Well, uh, Mr. Mukhisu has uh, really said this before. It needs courage We stop a lot of talks. We, we do the job. Mm. We must come with innovative ways. We can talk about it until the cows come home. In my place, we have a lot of camels. <laughs> but I can tell you, nothing talk about will happen. It until the camels come home. <laughs> nothing will happen until someone takes uh, right. the, the, the political decision to be able to move this forward. Right. That's why in UPU, we have broken all conventional, uh, I mean, studies and uh, uh, procrastinations and everything. We want to go with a bold vision right. to governments and tell them this is how it's going to work. And that's what would have been driving agendas for, for action. And, so, I th and I think you play a critical role in that whole marketing, development marketing, to explain to people and to show people what works. Isaac, you had a specific question for you concerning the gaps and, 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 and what really informs that. Okay. So I think the, the question there was about use of mobile money for businesses to pay their suppliers. Um, so traditionally, and as has been explained before by my predecessors here, M-Pesa was a money transfer service. So you would have me sending money to my parents back at home. And to answer Malawi's question, that is why it was successful, because if I tell my mom that she has to get a mobile phone, for me to send her some money monthly, then she has no option than to mm. get that phone. <laughs> so there was a need to transfer money, especially back to the rural areas. And mm -hmm. I think Kenyans are also very generous. When it comes to fundraisings, we are very good in contributing. And mobile money, again, m opened that opportunity. So mm -hmm. there was need, and the platform just fulfilled that need. So it was very easy to convert. Excellent. Now, for the businesses, for the longest time, we've seen businesses collect money through M-Pesa. And what they do next is to bank that money into the bank accounts. 
So M-Pesa has been a pipe for businesses. Until recently, we started looking at having businesses use the same money that they collect to do transactions with other businesses. So if, for example, you're a merchant selling bananas outside here and you take M-Pesa and you have a Kenya power or electricity bill to pay, you don't have to withdraw that money to your phone for you to pay to KPLC. You can actually pay directly from the collection still. So I think as we expand that more, we'll see more businesses doing that, especially the mid-level businesses, the SMEs. Corporates and government agencies have a different way of controlling the funds collected, so they might not be able to pay immediately from M-Pesa for some time, and especially for governments because they don't pay ex -source. Okay. So it's a process that we need to look at as we go Thank forward. Thank you very briefly, Elizabeth. Just, just quickly, so Copa Copa was the company famously that started uh, buy goods, right? And um, it was an innovation on M-Pesa, and then it, it became part of M-Pesa's product suite. But that was really serving the needs of merchants. So it's not just about collecting a larger amount. What merchants really need is the back end. So how do you reconcile those payments? Mm -hmm. So we work with a lot of companies who receive payments in cash. They receive payments in credit card. They receive payments from the national bank switch. So. Um, NIBS in Nigeria, for example, or K-Switch here in Kenya, and then they also receive from mobile money. That's almost like having four sets of accounts. Mm -hmm. So unless you can integrate that, it becomes too difficult, which is the same reason American Express struggled across Africa. It was a separate reconciliation system with a separate pricing fee. So I think we need to think about not just the actual you know, highway, but again, all these value-added service services that really make it easier for businesses to truly participate in reality. Thank you. Thank you. I think we are winding up the session now, and it's been a great panel. I really thank you. I will take a final comment from the floor from the lady in white because her hand was up. So rather than a question, what I suggest you do is make a comment instead. And I see that hand. If you can both be as brief as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to speak in French, if you'll allow me to. My name is Mineta Segure from the Advisory Council, the, and I have a company, Carapaz. I would like to speak about the fact that mobile money has been developed in Kenya, for example, but in most African countries, the concern at the highest level is that in order for Africa to be able to benefit from the digital economy, the CFTA must become a reality and provide solutions for electronic payment would be a very important contribution. So given the restrictions that are placed by the central bank through regulation of payment systems, how can, according to the panelists, we get to this interoperability stage, which goes beyond the transfers across borders, but also, for me, for example, I have an orange money account. Can I use that? How can I use that in Kenya to make payments? And the M-Pesa could be used the same way. That is the big question that exactly. we are all asking as we head toward including provisions in the CFTA for e-commerce, for digital business around Africa. Those are the questions that we are asking. Final comment, not a question, please, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Alkiru Hassan, um, Director of Orange Money from Niger. Uh, I would like to make an announcement on behalf of uh, Orange Group. Maybe uh, some of you, some of you, don't know that Orange launched, launched last month an uh, Pan African Hub, which can allow uh, Orange and uh, NTM uh, mobile money user uh, to mm. to use uh, this solution in half of the. Uh, mobile money market in Africa. Okay. We are uh, um, uh, in 22 market in Africa, both Orange and uh, uh, MTM. This hub is called Mwali. So uh, the main the main objective of this hub is to allow all um, operator who operate in Africa to use uh, this hub in order to make transaction. Even we come to Kenya if. M-Pesa is uh, a member of this hub. We can use your orange money account in Kenya to make payments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. So Orange and uh, MTN. Yes. 
are doing something across Africa right now. We're finalizing the panel. I want a parting shot, 10 seconds, literally from each of you. What would you leave us with as we look to mobile money to transform the future of Africa? 10 seconds, Charles, what's your message? Uh, my message is that we should look beyond just mobile money. It's actually e-commerce. In other words, we look at mobile payments across all, all platforms. And it should be about value creation and GDP growth. Thank you very much. Isaac? For me, it's, it's more to push on open platforms. And I would say m -Pesa has become open. We have published our open APIs. And I would encourage anyone out there who is interested in working with m -Pesa. I know about Mowali for regional interoperability, so we are looking at that as well. It's, it's open platforms and interoperability. Excellent. Thank you. Elizabeth, please. Yes. I would love to apply for this open platform, <laughs> which I would just say that truly open for everybody, even the scary innovators. Thank you very much, Hussein. Ecomat Africa, and we don't leave anybody behind. Total comprehensive solution for logistics, for transportation, for uh, doing business across uh, Africa. And I must say, you preach the gospel of the postal service very well. Um, you. Please, you're going <laughs> to. Thank you very much. I think for me, it's moving to the next frontier in terms of we have already provided a payments platform. What most rural Kenyans would like is a platform to sell their surplus and a, pay, a seamless payments, efficiency payment platform. That is what will solve the productivity problem. That is what is going to, go to solve the unemployment problem. And finally, it is what is going to, to, uh, to solve the poverty problem in Kenya. Thank you so much. Dr. Ari, you have the final word. Yes, uh, first of all, uh, we, we know a, a multiplicity of efforts Orange MTN, Safaricom MTN, the developmental state must take leadership. There are some things that the corporate sector can do, but there's some push that is only possible with a concurrent effort by governments. African governments have to own the priority and facilitation of this integrated uh, electronic market of Africa. Uh, second thing, to thank you, Madam Moderator, thank our audience and express our appreciation for this session. Thank you. Asante Sana, a warm round of applause for the panel. Thank you very much. I'll finish with a proverb I, I shared earlier. To cut a tree, you do what? To learn to cut a tree, you cut a tree. Let's keep cutting. Let's cut. Thank you very much, the Thank panel. You. Thank you. Professor. Already on Twitter. Thank you very much.